Good morning. Uh, so glad you could tune in this morning. Uh, those of you that uh, can't make it to our outdoor service, remember next uh, week, uh, the 27th, we start our indoor services in two different places, live streaming. Uh, praise the Lord, Brother Galen knows how to do all that. Or we would be up a creek. We will still be taping for those who are not comfortable coming. We'll be getting a letter talking about the procedures for safety that we've instituted, and I hope you'll take time to read that letter, please. Um, let's just start. Uh, I want to look at Jesus Forgives Us today from Colossians uh, chapter 1, beginning with verse 11. Uh, it says, or verse 12, it says uh, that we're to give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. Help us to understand it. Uh, we want to thank you for all you do for us. And Father, we want to especially praise you for sending Jesus down across in our place and for pro providing forgiveness for us. In Christ's name, amen. Some folks are enamored by the Civil War. You might call them Civil War buffs. They study all the different battles. They go to the uh, monuments. Uh, they uh, go to the battlefields. They collect memorabilia. They argue about it back and forth, etc., etc. They just really like that period of history. But the Civil War was between the Union and Confederate States. It was supposed to be a short war, the North thought, and it lasted four long years, from April 14th, 1861, to May 26th, 1865. Uh, the thing that we need to understand is that it cost 600,000 lives, a little over 600,000 lives. In our day, it would cost $5 billion for the property that was destroyed during the war. But the most important thing that we tend to forget about the war is that it, flee, it freed over 4 million black slaves from the tyranny of awful slavery and being treated as possessions. There's an even greater victory that was won over 2,000 years ago outside the little city of Jerusalem. But this one was won by one life, Jesus' life on a cross. And yet it has freed millions through the ages from sin and death and the penalty of sin. We need to understand that Jesus died in my place, in your place, in our place, so we could be forgiven. And when I say that, we say amen, we sort of dismiss it without really thinking about what that means. See, Jesus saves us completely. No aspect of salvation was ignored by God in sending the Son to be the sacrifice for us, for our sin. In these few short verses, the Apostle Paul lists five things for which we should thank Jesus that he did in dying for us. The first one's in verse 12, he qualified us. Again, verse 12 says, giving thanks to God the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Now, the first thing I notice about that verse is we didn't qualify ourselves. The Bible is very plain on that in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, for by grace you saved through faith and that is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest like any man should boast. In the book of Romans chapter 3 it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It goes on in chapter 6 verse 23 and says, The wages of sin is death. We need to understand that apart from God's grace, we were not qualified for God's kingdom. As a matter of fact, the only thing we were qualified for, apart from God's grace and mercy and love, was God's wrath. The wages of sin is death. And we are sinners by nature and choice. And because of that, we deserve death and hell. 
Scriptures like Ephesians 2, 1 and 3 and Ephesians 2, 12 speak of our condition apart from Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. We are under Satan's influence. We are in his kingdom. The spirit of who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Then he goes on in verse 12, he says, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. We do not qualify ourselves. God qualified us by the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. Uh, Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19, telling us about our former condition. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienating, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, they've given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and greediness. There was no hope for us apart from God qualifying us through the saving work of Jesus Christ. But he did qualify us. The word qualified there means to make sufficient, to make fit, to empower, to authorize. In other words, God qualified the unqualified by the saving work of Christ, by the shed blood of Christ on the cross. We are qualified now to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Inheritance is an interesting word. It refers back to Joshua casting lots to divide up the promised land. In other words, he cast a lot and this tribe got this and he knew your place in the promised land. He's called us to be partakers of all the promises of God. He's qualified us to be partakers of our inheritance with him forever. We can't qualify ourselves. Sometimes I think that because we're born in this land, we forget all the blessings of being a citizen of our country, the freedoms, the rights, uh, what we have that other people long for. And yet if we would study what those who become naturalized citizens, those who have to take the test and study in the classes, we would understand how grateful we should be. They study parts of the Constitution. They have to learn English. They have to have a certain kind of a job to qualify to stay here. And then they have to pass that test, which most high school seniors could not pass in our day about what the Constitution says and how the law reads and what are the responsibilities of being a citizen. And yet God didn't make us take a test. We would have failed. God didn't put us through the ringer. No, he sent his son to die in my place and your place to qualify us to be partakers in his kingdom with the saints in the light. Out of the kingdom of darkness, representing Satan and the power of sin. Into the kingdom of light, representing Jesus and forgiveness and hope. And we need to ask, what have we done with that? We need to ask, are we partaking as citizens of the kingdom of light? We need to thank him for qualifying us. The second thing is in verse 13a, he delivered us. Paul goes on, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. He has delivered us. God in Christ delivered us from the power of darkness, the power of sin, the kingdom of Satan. Delivered means to draw to oneself. It means to rescue. In our day, we picture like this. Somebody is drowning. They're going down for the last time. The lifeguard reaches out in the water, pulls them to himself, and swims safely to shore. We're rescued. We're delivered. You see, 
We need to understand this happens when we're born again. Jesus in John 3 said, you must be born again. Without being born again, we won't see the kingdom of God. We need to understand it happens when we're born again because 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if any person is in Christ Jesus, we've been born again into his kingdom. He is no longer the same. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He's delivered us. From that power of sin. We were rescued from the power and the authority of darkness. From Satan's kingdom. We were delivered from that. Do we understand that? It, it sort of goes like the song says. The song says, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply staying within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now say, am I? Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. And yes, I know, I'm off key. But we understand it was God's love that lifted us. He delivered us when we could not help ourselves. We're no longer under the tyranny of Satan, under the power of sin. God in his rich mercy and grace has qualified us. He has delivered us by the saving work of Jesus Christ. And we should be thankful. We should never get over being saved. We should never be, oh, Jesus saves us completely. should not be a whole hum statement. We should be grateful. We need to ask, are we? Are we telling others about it? So he qualified us. He delivered us. And he transferred us. The last part of verse 13 says that. He delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Conveyed there, I use the word transferred. It means he transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the son of his love. It was an immediate transfer. Transfer means to remove, to change. It was a picture again in, in the older times. Uh, even up until the Greek times, usually the conquering general, the conquering king, would take the people he had conquered and would move them to a new land and a new life. When we're saved, Immediately, Jesus takes us from that power of darkness, that kingdom of Satan, and moves us to the kingdom of light, his kingdom. God does that for us. He delivers us immediately to that. So we're no longer under that authority and that power, but under God's authority and God's power. We have a new ruler. His name is Jesus. We're transferred to the kingdom of the son of his love. It's the kingdom of light. It's the kingdom of love. It's the kingdom of hope. And it represents a change of everything from wrath to love, from despair to from, from <clears throat> judgment and despair to hope and blessing. He transferred us. Again, there's a song that goes, In loving kindness Jesus came my soul in mercy to reclaim and from the depths of sin and shame through grace he lifted me from sinking sand he lifted me with tender hand he lifted me from shades of night to plains of light oh praise his name he lifted me Jesus lifted us when we accept him out of the darkness, out of sin, out from under the authority of Satan, into the kingdom of light to be partakers with the saints, to live forever with him. He delivered us. He transferred us. He qualified us. What have we done with that? The fourth thing that he does, he redeems us. The first part of 14, 14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood. We have redemption through his blood. This is a New Testament word that is so wonderful. It is, it is uh, deep. Here's what it means. Redemption means to deliver by the payment of a ransom. In other words, he bought us back from the power of sin. He bought us back 
from being a slave of sin. In that day, in the Roman day, when Paul wrote this, slaves were everywhere. Everybody knew about slavery, its awfulness, its hopelessness. You would never rise above that. Your children would be born into slavery, etc., etc. But you see, Jesus came to buy us back from being slaves of sin. He, he paid the ransom, the price, to set us free. By his blood, he bought us back. Sometimes we can't relate to that. We don't understand being slavery. If you've ever had an addiction, if you've been an alcoholic or if you've been a drug addict or other addictions, you know a little bit about the power that you're under, that you're a slave to that addiction. You may want to do something about it, but by yourself on your own, you cannot. Booker T. Washington speaks of being a slave. He... He founded the famous Tuskegee Institute. He, he helped uh, uh, the black folks and the Negroes, if you want to call them that, to, to get an education. He said, I was born a slave on a plantation in Franklin County, Virginia. I'm not quite sure the exact place or uh, even the date of my birth, but I know I was born. As nearly as I've been able to learn, I was born near a crossroads post office called Haley's Ford. The year was either 1858 or 1859. I don't know the month or the day. The earliest impression that I can recall is living in the slave quarters. It was a hard life. It was in the midst of the most miserable, desolate, and discouraging surroundings which I was born. Then he goes on. I remember when they first told us we were free. I remember a stranger coming. He later found out it was a Union officer. And he read a rather long paper, the Emancipation Proclamation, and said, we were all free. We could go wherever we wanted to go. They were shouting. They were rejoicing. My mother was crying. She bent over and gathered all of her children together, me included, and told us what that meant. And that she'd been praying for so long and she feared she'd never see the day when she would be free and her children could have a chance to live in freedom. And I would venture to say that Booker T knew what it was like to be physically free as a Christian spiritually free. Do we understand that Jesus died to redeem us, to buy us back from slave? We have the right the authority of God, the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, we can tell sin, no! It does not have dominion over us. It does not have to rule over us. We are free in Christ Jesus. Not free to go and sin, but free to serve. Not free to live a life of a despot, to live a life of holiness and righteousness. Not free to dishonor the name of Christ, but live for Christ and serve Him as the one who bought us and set us free from death and sin. The fifth thing and the last thing. It says, not only do we have redemption through his blood, we have the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness, I think we should know that word, but it means to pardon, to remove the penalty. That's the simplest definition. But how far did that go? Psalm 103 verse 12 said, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins and our transgressions from us. In Micah 7, 19, it says, He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities under His feet. Yes, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. What has He done? Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 6 says this of our Messiah, of Jesus. Yet He Himself bore our sicknesses. He carried our pain. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. We were healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We've all turned our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity, the sin of us all. Jesus 
provided our forgiveness. He forgave us. Our sins cost him his life. Our sins cost him the suffering. Our sins cost him to leave heaven's glory and die on a cold Roman cross where he was buried and then rose the third day. Yet he forgave us when we ask him to. You're not born a Christian. You come to a point where the Holy Spirit brings you under conviction of your sin. Where you're convinced that the only way to be rightly related to God is through Jesus Christ. And when you ask Him to forgive your sin and come into your life and be the boss and you surrender it to Him, you're saved. So you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. For that's who He is. But it should change the way we live. I see you'll be stuck on him today. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. See, all these things that he qualified us, he delivered us, he transferred us, he redeemed us, and he forgave us, I mean we should live differently. That we have hope. We have a future. We should tell others. We should live in a rejoicing lifestyle. Which for me is a hard thing. I tend to look at the dark side of life rather than the happy side. Praise the Lord. He gave me a wife who's just the opposite. And yet there are many Christians who are living defeated lives today. Living in past sins that were forgiven long ago. And they can't grow to understand what freedom in Christ really means because of forgiveness. It goes back to slaves in the Civil War. A noted historian named Shelby Foote wrote a work called The Civil War. And about the slaves being given freedom, he said they were freed from the Manson Proclamation. The word spread from Washington, Virginia, to the Carolinas, even to the southern plantations of Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. Slavery illegal. It was abolished, said the newspaper headlines. And yet, something amazing took place. Something awful took place. The greater majority of slaves still lived in the same spot, living as though they were not free. All the way through the Reconstruction period. They were locked in a caste system where whites were here and they were still here. In some ways, our country still struggles with that. There is such a thing as social justice and we need to know that Christians should be for social equity and justice. All lives matter. The lives of the unborn, the lives of the black, the Hispanic, the Chinese, the white. All lives matter. But too many live like the former slave in Alabama who was asked what he thought of the Emancipation Proclamation. And he, like many others, mumbled in his day, and here's what he said. I don't know nothing about Abraham Lincoln, except they say he got us free, and I don't know nothing about that either. Too many Christians are living like we're still under slavery. Too many are still chained to the past. Too many are not growing in Christ. Too many are not living out their freedom in such a way that it glorifies God. Too many forget to wake up in the morning and thank God. Thank Jesus for everything He's done for us. This morning, if you don't have the joy and the freedom of your salvation, maybe you need to come and rededication and ask God for that. If you don't know any kind of freedom because you've never been saved, you've never surrendered to grief, Jesus. You're still in that kingdom of darkness enslaved by sin and you don't know what Jesus has done for you and I've just told you and you need to come and ask him to forgive you and to be the boss of your life and be saved. You need to do that. Some need to come and be church members. I don't know. But see, we are supposed to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven even though right now we're living in a foreign land. Because we've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the sons of love, the kingdom of light and love, of joy and freedom. You make your decision what you need to do today. Father, we pray the decisions we made that will honor and glorify you. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done that completely saves us. 
In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Till next time, we'll see you later. Remember the 27th. And if there's, we're divided A through H, and then the next division to try to switch, switch around, and who gets to be up there and who gets to be down here. Unless you have a certain group and you know the divisions are different, you can call and all sit up there in one group as a family group. Maybe you're a single, but there are certain ones you see every week you want to sit with, we'll do that for you too, but reserve it at the church and it'll be up there. Call the office. Bye now. Thank you.